Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're in for a fun afternoon. Um, I'm Miriam Lawrence, and I'm here to welcome you to Fridays at One, a program of lectures and events sponsored by the Institute for Retired Professionals here at the New School. And it's funded by a bequest in the memory of Estelle Tolkien. The IRP was founded 48 years ago. In, it is the first in what was to become a national movement in lifelong learning. We're very proud to have played such a pivotal role in being the model for this, for this national movement. Um, at the IRP, we develop our own curriculum and participate as both the students and the leaders of our study groups based on the principle of shared inquiry and peer learning. And if you'd like more information about the IRP, we have a sign-up sheet outside these doors, and we invite you to leave your name, your address, and your email, and we'll send you further information. So I'd like to turn this over to my colleague, Gloria Troy, who has the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Gloria? Thank you. <clears throat> no, got these. Good afternoon, and welcome to the second of three programs in the Fridays at One Spring Series. Many of us who grew up in New York have our own special memories of Coney Island. I grew up in the Bronx, but I had an aunt and uncle who lived in Brighton Beach. We visited them frequently, and while the adults were visiting, my cousins and I took a walk on the boardwalk. We went to the beach, we went on the rides, and we never missed our favorite part of the day, eating hot dogs at Nathan's. <laughs> These are great memories, and I really cherish them. I spent a day at Coney Island this past summer after not being there for a very long time, <clears throat> and a lot has changed. Today, to tell us about some of those changes is Stuart Pertz, who knows a lot about the Coney Island I remember and Coney Island the way it is now, as well as the plans for the future. Stuart Pertz is an architect, an urban designer and planner, a facility strategist, and a community planning advocate. He has designed housing, academic, and commercial buildings, created development and redevelopment plans for existing and new communities, and has led teams providing counseling and restructuring services for corporations and governmental agencies in the United States and abroad. He is active as a planning committee member and chair of Brooklyn Advocacy Projects for the Municipal Arts Society and as a member of the executive committee of the Campaign for Community-Based Planning. He's a professor of architecture and planning at Pratt Institute and was chair of the graduate program in urban design. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and past member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. He has served as a member of the New York City Planning Commission and as chairman of the board of the University Settlement, America's first such community service organization. Mr. Pertz received his BA and MFA in architecture at Princeton University. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Stuart Pertz. And what I need is an image. <laughs> There you go. Thank you very much. Someone had said some time ago when we were working on Coney Island that there, there were very few people that were interested in Coney Island. I think that's probably not true. Uh, two questions. Uh, how many people have been to Coney Island? OK, that was easy. How many people have been to Coney Island in the last five years? That's amazing. Terrific. How about the last week? Not bad. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good. Now, bear bear with me. This this um, the the when I give presentations, I usually have a slide projector that they carry in, and I remember how to do this. So just if if you see the wrong slide at the wrong time, just mention it to me. It might it might help. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I know. We're going to take a ride through 150 years of the making, unmaking, and perhaps making again a magical place of incredible wonder. We'll start with some context and some history. We'll look at where we are. We'll take stock of what we're certain will happen. 
and will try to push along what has already begun to be an even better Coney Island. The major thanks go to the sources of my material, by the way. Uh, I have filched shamelessly from Charlie Jensen's uh, book, uh, Coney Island Lost and Found, and I am very grateful to him. Uh, he said okay, but still. Uh, I've taken liberally from the work of the Municipal Arts Society, but I hope they'll forgive me since I was part of its doing. And I've had terrific input from three friends, Aaron Beebe, Juan Rivero, and Jasper Goldman of Coney Island, USA, Save Coney Island, and Jasper's somewhere in Cuba. Any anything I say is built on the work, of course, of the city agencies, the mayor and the borough president and the councilman from the area, Dominic Recchia, and the community board that protects it, community board 13. We can't talk about Coney Island should, uh, without seeing what it was and what happened there and the fact that everywhere things have changed, not just Coney Island. Uh, Coney was a bucolic bit of Indian land. It's the bit at the bottom of this map. I mean, those of you who know could find it on the map, but there it is. Uh, uh, Coney was a bucolic bit of Indian land until the middle of the 17th century, when Gravesend was founded, and Coney Island itself was considered common lands of Gravesend. Charlie Denson tells us that a farmer named Opdyke, see if you can follow this, farmed the land claimed ownership, and after trying to sell it to the town, which thought they owned it, sold it to a guy named the Wolf, who used it to produce salt, and told the townsfolk they couldn't use it anymore, and they burned them down. That's how Coney Island's history of real estate skullduggery, fights and fires, began, and it was to be repeated over and over and over again. The first trespassers, really, not yet welcome visitors, arrived about 1800. By 1850, there were toll roads, a ferry, and hotels. And just a decade later, 1860, there was a horse-drawn railroad. More railroads were added, and with the help of an excessively entrepreneurial crook named James McCain, and the names Corbin, Stilwell, Engman, and Culver, all of which are scattered around Brooklyn, the development of a booming resort was underway. A million people came to Brighton Beach and its hotel by train by 1880. A million people. And it was the watering place for all types. There was a racetrack. You can see that, by the way, just on the right. It's Engman's race course. There would be everything from an enormous boxing stadium to the hot dog and everything in between. It was a terrific place to go from a crowded, noisy city to a cool and breezy beach, but it was the ease of getting there that made the difference. And remember that. Much of the development in Coney Island was built in order to make the trains profitable, not in fact the other way around. And although not for long, they were very profitable. And worthy of major investments, here's the terminal of the Brooklyn, Flatbush, and Coney Island line at Brighton Beach, named after its illustrious cousin, but spelled differently. Just after the turn of the century, with the racetrack on the east, Seagate residential community growing on the west, and three of the most phantasmagoric amusement meccas in between, Luna Park, Dreamland, and Steeplechase, Coney Island was accommodating millions, employing tens of thousands as the largest, most amazing amusement area in the country. This is a view along, West's, uh, along Surf Avenue, a view west along Surf Avenue, showing the development as a strip along both sides of Surf with nothing beyond the creek. So you can see just off that way, and you can see our friend, the elephant, as promised. They say that passengers on incoming liners could see the elephant before they saw the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> it was a hotel. The size is a little bit exaggerated, and it had a reputation to match. Uh, it made the phrase, seeing the elephant, have a whole new meaning. I will talk to some of you about that later. I don't <laughs> want to discuss what it meant, but you can figure it out. 
There were cars, there were trolleys, there were boats, there were railroads that got folks there, and it was a whole city just for fun. Some of it was fake, but it all was just like a city. And there were people galore, incredible crowds, all very well dressed, thank you. Uh, Ken Burns said it best. The first step is to get emotional excitement into the very air. They named their park Luna, not for the moon, as some thought, but for Skip's sister Luna, over in Bayonne, New Jersey. <laughs> By opening night, Thompson and Dundee had only $11 left between them and had to comb the island to come up with change for the ticket takers. At eight o'clock on the evening of May 16th, 1903, the gates opened. About 45,000 men, women, and children strolling along Surf Avenue stopped and rubbed their eyes and stood in wonder and pinched themselves to see if there was not something wrong somewhere. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. Thompson and Dundee had decorated their forest of towers and minarets with 250,000 incandescent lights. It was, one man said, an electric Eden. Here is alchemy. Here in full view of thousands, in tiers of boxes and promenades, the spotted horses, the clowns, the acrobats, jugglers, hoop artists, intellectual elephants, Arabian pyramidists, tumblers, contortionists, disport under the crackling lashes of the ringmaster. You felt you were in the Orient, you felt you were in different parts of the world. And the buildings itself made you feel that you were a great chieftain. And these were your temples, and you could go in there just for a nickel. You could become a, a chieftain yourself. You could be almost anything you wanted. All the fairy tales that you read as a little boy were coming true right here in Luna Park. Heaven. You went down this thing at this unbelievable speed and you hit the water and you got covered with the spray and everyone was shouting and then you would go across this wonderful lagoon with little lights around the edge. It was just fantastic. Ah, God, said one visitor, what might the prophet have written in Revelation? if only he had first beheld a spectacle like this. Thompson and Dundee made a formidable team. In just six weeks, they had paid back every cent of the $700,000 it had cost to build Luna Park. By season's end, they were rich men. That's, that's Ken Burns, if you, if those of you who haven't seen it, there's more of the film, <clears throat> and, and clearly, as you can notice, worth seeing. Uh, so there was Luna Park. There was also uh, Dreamland, another great amusement park, a more formal design, about the same size, uh, slightly more staid, uh, but still pretty amazing. Uh, it sported the tallest building and another shoot to shoot, which you can see uh, in this and this image. Uh, and this one went straight into the sea. There was a railroad ride and a bathhouse and a pier. And there was the first incubator for premature babies. <laughs> Seriously, they, the, the hospitals wouldn't, wouldn't accept it as an idea. Uh, the doctor decided it would be a sideshow and ran it as a sideshow for years. There was, there was, I gather, a um, uh, 
something like 2,500 people who were saved by this device who came together once to, to celebrate the happening. So it was a serious event, but it was a, a sideshow. They did other things that were not as pleasant. The first major electric light display, uh, this, the incubator, and the hot dog, uh, Silicon Valley, eat your heart out. Uh, there was even a fake fire that preceded the real fire. That was the park's demise hardly a decade after it opened. The Frankfurter was uh, first promoted by Feltman's, not Nathan's. Feltman's went on to be one of the largest eateries in town, far and away. Uh, but nothing lasted longer than Nathan's, which we all know and still love. There were lots of hotels. The very elegant Manhattan Beach Hotel at the far east end. The Jefferson, and there were dozens of little ones everywhere. The trains were celebrated appropriately, serious stations. And the lines that fed into them are still running today, not as often and perhaps not even as comfortably. But as many transit routes from Manhattan that there were, there were still many who would drive down Ocean Parkway, the tree-lined pride of Brooklyn, to find, a, to find Coney Island at the end. It is a problem today. By the way, just for a note, Mr. Ford made cars you could have any color, if you remember, as long as you uh, got black. But they did still arrive every way they could. All three of the amusement parks burned. Steeplechase revived to amuse another day, but Dreamland burned in 1911, less than a decade after it started operating in Luna Park in 1940. You can see the shoot to shoot of Dreamland off in the distance on the left. George Tillyou was the first to build his vast amusement park in the 1890s, preceded the other two. It burned by half in 1907. It was rebuilt to its mostly same state that we've all remember it uh, until it closed in the 1950s. But you can see this first uh, incarnation was, was far bigger. Uh, in its vast pavilion, there were the front end of a mechanical racetrack, endless rides that bump people into one another on slides and in a rolling tunnel, I absolutely loved it. And there were rides for all. I am sure I see myself on one of those horses. <laughs> Until the early 1920s, the beach houses, hotels, restaurants, dance halls, and amusements came straight down to the water. In some places, at high tide, there was hardly any beach at all. The boardwalk was built and the beach was extended in the early 20s. Somebody noticed there was a Coney Island. I mean, the pictures of the crowds is just still, still makes me giggle. <clears throat> the boardwalk was then straightened out by Robert Moses, indicated by the dotted line. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a dotted line just runs. Can you? OK. Uh, demolishing what the decadent amusements that he despised. He hated Coney Island and all it stood for. And all the war, all, all the war years intervened and amusements remained popular. There was a growing pressure led by Moses to make another Jones Beach at Coney Island, in other words, no amusements, uh, and to replace the honky tonk with housing. He wouldn't be the last. After the war, New York and many urban areas across the country changed dramatically. There was the flight to the suburbs, the poor pushed out of neighborhoods, houses burned, and land left empty. Uh, that's Jimmy Carter in the Bronx looking at Charlotte Street, if you all can remember those times. And in Manhattan's Alphabet City, there was abandon abandonment, fire, and failed urban renewal, like everywhere else. Nothing old was good. Penn Station's destruction, however, shown here, so incensed the public and those that recognized the value of our architectural legacy that finally New York's preservation movement was born. 
but it took that and a lot more to make it happen. Something to remember. And Coney Island was no different. Wonderful buildings and stuff of dreams went up in flames and down by the demolisher's ball. It wasn't all that easy to explain because each place in the country had a slightly different story. But basically, there was a middle class flight on new roads with cheap cars to houses with subsidized mortgages. There was air conditioning and there was TV. And left behind with some intentional neglect were the poor and the blight that chased away whatever market there might have been, in our case, in Coney Island. It wasn't only Coney Island, it wasn't only Coney Island, but it was Coney Island. Here's the Half Moon Hotel before and on its way to being after. And it wasn't just the amusements or the hotels, but it was places to live that were at risk. Humble, perhaps, not very sometimes, but nothing warranted this or this. They were burned by landlords for insurance or kids alienated from life. And after a while, no one noticed. So in simple terms, this is where we now are. What Coney Island in his heyday covered was most of the yellow and some continuing way east to Manhattan Beach. Luna Park, Dreamland, and Steeplechase are in purple so you get a sense of the scale that was just the core. And the area now considered as the amusement area by the city zoning is in green. In the planning for the new zoning, there was some who felt that there was too little left worth saving of what was once the great Coney Island amusement park. And housing was a greater need and a better choice. The economy and your presence here may well change that. So, so as it is, we'll talk a little bit about what's up with the larger community that's Coney Island, what Coney Island is worth to New York, the brand, and as we move forward, uh, what's there that we can really build on. However wonderful the, the potential and our push for even more, which you'll see at the end of this, uh, amusements are a small part of the peninsula and not the only issue that needs to be addressed. It is home to thousands of people in large blocks of apartments and small homes, some public housing and some narcs, if you don't know the term, it's naturally aging residential communities. <laughs> the people who moved to Luna Park loved it, and they're still the people who moved to Luna Park, like us. Sorry about that, but that's about the vintage. And all of them need safety, services, business, and jobs. So. You know, let's, it's not one thing or the other, it's get it both. The housing over the years was much related to the beach, of course, expanses of bungalows and summer residents, but there was always a community much like the rest of Bu Brooklyn that thrived. The first major housing development, large scale, of which there's a great deal now, was built in the 1950s. And however we think of Coney Island again, it's home to all of those families. Still. If there are complaints about the noise of the mating seals in Luna Park houses, and there are, at the aquarium, imagine what building closer to the hopefully growing amusement area would be. The brand doesn't need selling in this room, clearly. Nothing matches the renown of Coney Island as a brand. Go anywhere in the world and ask. Just any language, any world. Try Coney Island. See if you don't get a smile. And Steeplechase, Steeplechase's laughing clown may be the most familiar image now on a beer bottle, uh, but most of its, of its brand and its image is, is carried in our minds. Culturally, it's had an amazing app, uh, impact in music, in literature, in film. You have to check out the four pages of Wikipedia to just get to know who and what. Woody Guthrie, Neil Diamond, Neil Sadaka, Lou Reed, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Jose Marti, O. Henry, Woody Allen, Andrew Lloyd Webber, that's just the beginning. It is a big part of the culture that surrounds us. And there's still plenty that's good in the amusement area. There's good access. There's some terrific facilities. The 
the, uh, the stadium, uh, the amphitheater at, at, uh, uh, that's soon to be at Ashley V. Park, uh, the aquarium. Uh, there was Astroland when this drawing was done. Sorry about that. Uh, but there will be more. It is still filled with incredible potential. The beach is still the best, absolutely the best. It is true that air conditioning, TV, and the roads to other places changed our recreational diet, but it's still the best. One of the best in the entire world, and just the car and sub ride away. Well, not just, but we'll come to that in a minute. And there are still some architectural treasures that have been saved. This Coney Island USA, send money, they'll save more. They're terrific. And thanks directly to our mayor, who personally saved the B&B carousel. Someday, hopefully, somehow, we'll get some others back. And some very responsible new architecture has happened as well. A new Stillwell Avenue station with suitable obeisance to the old and credited with being the largest and the most environmentally responsible elevated station in the world. And there are lots on the docket that have happened, that, that will there are lots on the docket that are about to happen. Uh, and lots of players that are making it happen. There's the parks, there's the aquarium. And, and just let me point out a new one. Everyone's smiling favorite now is Zamperla's coming to town, thanks to, to, a, to a surprisingly active field of bidders for the master lease for the city-owned land in the amusement area. With all the pushing and shoving that we still think is needed for a better and better Coney Island, rest assured, no one underestimates the applause and the hope for Zamperla's success. And although Thor Equities, Taconic, and the city now own most of Coney Island, I'm sure there'll be more stories to tell about how that trading goes on. Uh, back to what we can expect. Uh, just as a bit of history, more history, once uh, perf the aquarium, the New York Aquarium was perfectly located at the Battery uh, that's the old building that the aquarium uh, was in. It had two million visitors a year. The new aquarium in Coney Island has 700,000 visitors a year. So it's got a way to go. And, and part of that is being addressed. There's be a new aquarium master plan which will finally, whoops, sorry, which will open the, the rather closed building on its south facade to the water and to the beach. Uh, there will be a new uh, major band shell at Asselievy Park. It's, it's Marty Markowitz's favorite. Uh, and it is, in, is coming along with an enormous amount of controversy from the neighbors, uh, which should, in fact, be a warning to those in the future who are planning new housing too close to the amusements. And soon, with an enormous amount of effort, a restored and rebuilt boardwalk, rotted partly by the years, but mostly due it due to a miscalculated sand fill beneath it. Uh, I, I played under the boardwalk because the first time I went after they filled it, I was absolutely shocked that the sand comes right up to it. Those who never knew what it was like, there was an under the boardwalk. Changed many of our lives. <laughs> the parachute jump in my memory is still one of the most glorious rides anywhere is restored. But unfortunately, it's restored as a relic. You can't use it. May I request now, before any other pushing that I will describe down the road, uh, that this icon be activated once again. It is just wonderful. The cyclone and the wonder wheel are landmark, and they're cared for, and they will stay. Uh, and it is still amazing what you can see from the top, and it is still really scary in the middle. Uh, the real estate issues in the amusement area have been as convoluted and, 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 and as significant as Coney Island real estate has been from the beginning. This part of the saga relates to the fact that the city's being open to a zoning change. In other words, when this process, process started, the city said, we'll consider changing the zoning from C7, which is all amusements, to maybe something else. Uh, once the city decided that that might be the case, it enticed the developer, Thaw Equities, to purchase and consolidate land in anticipation of what that change might be. Those purchases and subsequent wrangling brought the amusement area to a virtual standstill for a while. Nonetheless, sorry, nonetheless, acquisition by the city 
or the areas indicated in lighter green would clearly be desirable to consolidate and protect the future park. The amount of land in public ownership by comparison to that which needs to be acquired is really astounding. It's those, the, the light green is what the city has purchased, thank you very much, and the little fingers of, um, of aerial underneath uh, with the streets going between it, that's, that's the land that, that is still in private ownership. Hopefully handled well, perhaps a nudge from the city wouldn't hurt. Uh, even with all the work the city has done in the background in terms of land negotiations, there's still a lot to be done. The relative value of land for amusement purposes, the zoning for all the amusement areas of Coney Island was C7, remember, versus the value were it residential is amazing. Watch this. A piece of land bought for 14 million as amusements was sold for over 90 million just a few years later on the expectation of residential, 75 million in between well before, in theory, the city confirmed its direction. So someone was willing to risk a lot of money on the hope that. So here's the C7 amusement district prior to the recent changes. Uh, and, uh, and, and as you'll see, the city has purchased land, but it's, there's, there's more to do. Uh, and here's the, the sort of the critical issue. The, uh, uh, of the entire area, the yellow is now zoned as residential, not amusement. Uh, the uh, Municipal Credit Union Park, it's a tongue twister, uh, uh, which was King's Band Park, is in the middle. Uh, on the right is what remains designated generally as amusements. But as you'll see, part of that is hotels, part of that is other uses, not all amusements. This is the, uh, the illustrative plan of the zoning that's been approved. The city originally had a plan quite similar, but if you see on the right-hand side, there's an arrow. That arrow was in fact a third again higher, or half again higher actually. Uh, it went up to the next, the street above, and all of that was to be acquired by the city. But because of the negotiations, because of the change in price, because of the difficulty of doing that in the negotiations, the city backed off, which was in part, if not most significantly, why a lot of the opposition to the city plan generated. Prior to that, it seemed to, it seemed to be a compromise, but made some sense. At that point, it was sort of like, you know, that was a nail, we thought, in the coffin. Now, this, is, this, this for everybody is really important and for everybody well beyond this audience. Whatever any group believes about what coulda, shoulda, oughta be done, one thing is absolutely clear. This summer, 2010, needs to get the best minds, the best hearts, the pocketbooks and the politics focused on attracting New York and the world back to Coney Island. This is the Mermaid Parade. It's terrific, but it's once. Lots of stuff just like that. It will be a season that's worth going to. Uh, now, now for the, bear with me, now the editorial comes. The might, the could, and the shoulda. Uh, one is there should be a prosperous community. Sorry, I keep on doing that. That's a hand that touches. Uh, it should support safe and, 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 and services that they need. Uh, I don't want to lament the second piece. I don't want to lament the irretrievable losses of, of, of our architecture. It's just that the retrievable ones are made even more precious by that extraordinary loss. And of the last, Coney Island, I think, is on its way to being the best, but it needs a lot more room to grow, and it is, needs much easier ways to get there. The community has been polled, it's asked and disappointed for a very long time. We all know by now what they want. They want infrastructure, they want safety, they want activities for young kids, concern for emergency uh, egress, by the way, when the traffic is traffic, it's traffic. Uh, 
and they're worried about gentrification, but most, mostly at this stage, there's an enormous need for jobs. Uh, as far as saving things, the Shore Theater outside seems like a likely save. Uh, it's been put up to the Landmarks Commission, and it looks like they're going to deal with it. Uh, but all, although badly treated, the future of the inside is a little more precarious. We would like that all of it be saved and, and brought back. Uh, just think of what a spot that is. It's just across from the station. You walk across the street. You're into the movie theater. You can have, you know, you can have shows for two hours, for one hour. You then go to the beach, or you then go across the street to play. It's an amazing location. And there were plenty of plans. This is, this is a plan that was done the last uh, of, of, of the attempts to re revive Coney Island in its, in its completion. And it was killed by our former mayor, Giuliani, for all kinds of reasons. But uh, Key Span Park at the time just went right in the middle of it, and it was over. The, the, uh, the stadium. Uh, there were lots of plans, and lots and lots of plans of what to do, some more frightening than others. <laughs> Uh, but now the rubber has hit the road. Uh, zoning is set by the city. Uh, we need to push to make it work. And these are the things we think it needs. We realize, I realize clearly, that the zoning was a long slog and it's now the law. Uh, but I also realize that plans change. It's nice to get older. Everything that everyone says they're going to do tomorrow, they don't do tomorrow and often don't do or do anything like they say they're going to do. So, so events and times change, and the suggestions we're about to offer are for thoughtful consideration as time goes on. Now, this is the rendering of the likely results of the approved zoning. Uh, in in a, uh, a group at the MAS, with the help of DCP, we drew uh, a, uh, an aerial view of, of what it would be like. So the white on the, on the left and across Surf Avenue are all uh, housing, and the purple are hotels. Uh, before the hotels are potentially indoor uses, uh, restaurants and shops. Uh, and the amusement area is the strip at the bottom that hooks up with the cyclone uh, and, and, and you can just see the, 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 the wonder wheel uh, as part of it. Uh, the hotels, we think, will cut off the park from Surf Avenue. Uh, and this is what we think should happen. We would like, over time, as the economy gets better, uh, that a better use for the residentially proposed land across from Surf Avenue, where there will only be complaints by the people living there about the noise from Coney Island, uh, that better it should be hotels. They can afford the triple windows. And, uh, and they can, sorry, did I do something funny? I think I did. OK. Uh, they can afford the triple windows, and, and, and they can ensure that Surf Avenue becomes, uh, continues uh, to, uh, to be the Broadway of Coney Island. Uh, in turn, we think that the South should be a lower scaled uses, uh, mixed with amusements, and, and not zoned, but planned, so that it's integrated with the remainder of the property. As you can see, we think that the amusements should be much larger. We think the size as a result of the capacity that we think could come here is much too small. There was a... Um, uh, a very serious, sorry, I keep on doing this. Uh, there was a very, s is that it? Do I, st I keep on going back? Ah, thank you, sorry about that. There was a very serious uh, uh, marketing study to determine, to determine how many people would be willing to come to Coney Island if Coney Island worked. It was three and a half million people. There is a point at which you can't get any more people than a fixed amount in a certain space. And, and our concern is that the space allotted is too small. Uh, so, so although it's amazing that it's there, it would be better if it was more. And so that's a big part of, of what we're 
we're trying to get people to, to think about as, as time goes on. My private biggest concern is, everybody has one of them, I picked this one, is enlivening the boardwalk. I'm, I'm very concerned that, that what happens along the boardwalk will be so thin and sparse that it won't be the boardwalk that any of us remember because what kept people walking up and down it was something to do. It wasn't looking out at the sea. It was, it was looking at people doing things that made people look at them. <laughs> so, so what we think needs to happen is that there be more uses that face the passerby on the boardwalk. And to do that, that means that it takes a slice out of this very narrow piece of amusement park land that's presently available. So the two fight against each other, and we think that's why more land. And I know the city, it kills them to hear this, because it's been hard enough to get where they are. I know, I know, I know. But this is a treasure, and you blow it, you blow it forever. Uh, and not the least, lastly, uh, these are the only buildings that have any viable sense of historic um, uh, potential. Uh, maybe there are a few more, but, but we now know the Shore Theater and Coney Island USA are in good hands, or we hope they are. The Grasshorn Building, which certainly doesn't look terrific, I won't show you a picture of it because it really looks totally denuded, but it, the, there's a bank building, uh, there's Henderson's and there's Nathan's. They're all, uh, they're all filled with memories that I think are worth preserving. Uh, there is a piece of wonderful news. We don't know how it will turn out, but the city is releasing an RFP for a study to assess the viability of a pier on the seaside and perhaps one or choices between that and Coney Island Creek. Coney Island Creek, we didn't talk about, but it, it needs work, as they used to say. Uh, here's wishing for both. With environmental considerations clearly understood, it would be terrific to expand the options for res uh, recreation <laughs> out on the, on the pier. Uh, imagine having your prom party out there. Uh, and, and then as a place to provide access for this place of fun uh, via the ferry. Uh, this, is, this is Photoshop, don't think we found this somewhere. Uh, but interestingly enough, the express track exists. Uh, and see if you can follow this logic. In the economical thinking of our times, uh, MTA will provide access to Coney Island when there is a demand. But it's the demand that, but it's this access that makes the demand. So if you had a train to get them there, they'd get there and then be, they'd be the demand for the train. This is exactly how Coney Island began. The, the whole group of railroads that came in built things in Coney Island so that people would pay the fare to get to Coney Island. They made the money at both ends. But you wouldn't take the train if there wasn't some place to go. Well, so we need them to get the train so that we can get people to get there so that what we do can be supported. Let me see one more. Ah, it's OK. Uh, so you got it. Let's promote a vision that pushes the vision, that builds an industry, that brings jobs and brings revenue. Uh, let's visit ourselves and bring our families and have fun uh, because Coney Island is New York's playground, if not the world's, and we should continue to make it so. Thanks. Are you taking questions and comments? I am taking questions, and I'm sure I'm getting comments. Uh, will we pass the microphone? Ah, yes, you're, you're going to be... Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have a suggestion which might help economically. 
Uh, Coney Island would be a good venue for uh, uh, special events, corporate and private parties. There are uh, sometimes, at certain times of the year in the city, a shortage of venues for these type of events, and Coney Island would be an ideal venue for some types of these events and would help the area economically. That, that is a terrific point. We made a, just quickly, we made a study of, of, of event locations in the city of New York. New York is way below what it needs to be. And Coney Island is an enormously good opportunity for that. It needs access and it needs someone to make those spaces work so that they would, but that's a very good point. <laughs> Has there been any active fundraising um, sustained by the city to help develop the area? There, there is, uh, actually that's a very interesting question and I, I had sort of asked it uh, to, to there's, some, there's some folks in the back of the room from Coney Island USA who, who could do some fundraising and essentially that's who you would give your money to if you did. Uh, and the city gives them money but, but never enough. And there's another group called Save Coney Island that's there essentially doing the same kind of thing. So yeah, there are places to put money that would, that would enhance what could happen. What there isn't at the moment, and I'm not sure the mechanics or more likely the politics of how to make it happen, but Central Park has a conservancy. Uh, uh, Prospect Park would be nothing without its alliance. Uh, so, so that kind of equivalent, the Parks Department is, is, will be running a good part of this ultimately. Uh, so, and they're the ones that make those things happen, so maybe we push that that happens. And so a lot of the closing may well have been because it was expensive to keep it open. Uh, it also may have been because when it started to dim, a lot of people were getting older, they were still the owners and they were off to Florida, and they would close because they were finished for the summer, they made enough, done. So. I'm not absolutely certain, and I know the city's concerned about this, we are certainly concerned about this. Uh, indoor and glass is not so bad. Here we go back here. Uh, I just want to say a little bit about this summer. Um, I'm Aaron Beebe, I run the Coney Island Museum, and uh, we, the museum is open year round um, for anybody who wants to come down. But this summer, is I think we're really sort of coming out of the last five years of development kind of mayhem. Um, and uh, this summer is the summer to come down to Coney Island to sort of see this rebirth begin and to really kind of force, I think, if we see that this summer when there's a new ride operator in town, when the circus is coming back, when uh, the city has bought a bunch of land, if we see that things still aren't successful this year, it's gonna be very hard for us to make a case that you know, the amusement industry is you know, a thriving piece of New York history or New York uh, economic development. If this summer is successful, and I think it's probably gonna be the best summer we've had in a decade, um, if it is successful, I think then we go a long way towards the summer of 2011 and the summer of 2012 and sort of further on. So I you know, highly uh, encourage everybody to come down this summer. Um, the season actually opens in three weeks. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, we're, the new park opens Memorial Day. Um, so everything gets up and running full, full bore on Memorial Day. And sure, you, you can go to our website, which is ConeyIsland.com. Um, you can also see the city's uh, website, the central sort of repository for Coney Island, which is the Coney Island Fund Guide .com. And uh, is there another web? and saveconeyisland.net. Um, so those are really the sort of three central places to go. Thanks. There's so much to do, but I hope it's done. Thank you very much, Steve. Under the board.